I see it all the time, John, you know what I mean? As a spiritual father, I, I mean, I, I see it all the time as a human being in my own life, in my own experience. You know, the thing is, is uh, the tradition, orthodoxy is teaching me not to flinch. It, it's teaching me, it's teaching me to embrace the light when it's, when it, when it exposes me. But this is the assesses. This is the asceticism yeah. is don't flinch. Come on, bro. Don't, don't flinch. Hello, the sun is going down on Waltar. No, the sun is going down on Waltar. Right. The sun is going down on Waltar. See, guys, there's a lot happening on why are we talking about rabbits? Rabbits run down the rabbit holes. You find them all over the internet. Things that we shouldn't chase down there into Wonderland because they're confusing. But if you look closely every now and then, there's a really important rabbit something we should consider so we do that we consider the heavy things but we do it lightly why are we talking about rabbits today on watar we talk to the guys from royal path that's father turbo walls and his producer you can't say psychic because cyprian runs the show man he's wonderful meet royal path uh podcasters as we talk about race and we talk about, it's very interesting because both of them are men of color. We talk about race and we also talk about and are, I'm enchanted by the notion of being, the notion of how we know where we're going and what it means to be aware of the path. Like, how do we become illumined to where we're going? And is it possible today on Watar? But I want to make a toast to you guys just to start. So, Father Bless, uh, Lord, thank you for promise. being a, Amen. Amen. Uh, Cyprian, thank you for coming on uh, from Royal Path. You guys are doing something really cool. We have to talk about your introduction. <laughs> I love that <laughs> thing. That thing is, is that who did that? And, and and we have to talk about a couple cool cool subjects. But most of all, in our tradition. Uh, at a restaurant that we started called the the KP restaurant in Greenville, South Carolina. It's part of our nonprofit. We toast in the Georgian tradition. So here's a toast you would hear at the table. That would be really important um, to your arrival uh, as the outside and to the show being something like the inside. May the outside bring health and beauty to the inside and may the inside offer something as you walk away something known as love and a proper hospitality. So to you guys, Gagi Marjos, that means to you, the victory. Gagi Marjos. Gagi Gagi Marjos. Marjos. But I'm drinking a little, I'm not a day drinker, guys. Calm down, Father, please forgive me. <laughs> but uh, I drink when I do this, and this is a cognac from the Georgian Republic. Oh, nice. So, so there we I go. I love the Georgians. <laughs> How great are the Georgians? Maybe that, we get into that. They are the best. The Their best. iconography is like... Love that. I love it. Mm. And, and it teeters over toward uh, Ethiopian. It teeters toward like the East. It, it's yeah. just my favorite. The way that well, I've told go. people, Georgian iconography is the perfect synthesis of Byzantine and Ethiopian That's right. iconography. Oh, perfect I think synthesis. It, it's amazing. Yeah. And I think the Georgians, not unlike. Not unlike a lot of folks there in that part of the world, the Orthodox Georgians will have something to say about redemption as these two worlds, the new world and the old world. Mm. They have, there's something there, guys, 320 AD. That's when they started to take Christianity. <laughs> that's early. There's something in that culture that's redemptive. But anyway, Cyprian, you guys have the show. Father comes on. Who are you to each other? <laughs> How do you guys know each other? Is this a secret? Am I allowed to? Are you like Shantaram? Are you on the run, Cyprian, in Saipan? <laughs> well, Father Turbo is my spiritual father, and he's the the person who catechized me and baptized and chrismated me and continues to edify not just me now, but I guess a whole lot of people mm. uh, on a weekly mm. basis. And continues to catechize us and continues to help me grow in the faith. And I don't know what I could say about 
you know, I mean, I guess I could tell the story of of how Father Turbo and I came to meet, but you know, at the end of the day, what I know is that the fact that Father Turbo and I have a relationship is is maybe the boldest expression and proof to me of Christ the living God the as as a person and the yeah, fact right. that we can have a relationship with Christ because there's no good reason it makes absolutely no sense that I'm orthodox that Father Turbo is my spiritual father it makes no sense it's so unlikely that I can't say that it's anything except Christ at work well, give that's, us a taste what I of the unlikeliness. Overview. Give us just a a sample. What I can't, yeah. What's sure. unlikely about it? Well, I mean, I'm I'm speaking to you from Saipan, which is one of the most remote places I would say on Earth. Probably, it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It is a U.S. territory, but it's so remote as a U.S. territory that most people don't even know that it exists. Uh, and there are there are places here within the Commonwealth that I'm in, which is the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, that are as remote as any place in like, let's say, Alaska, in terms of human beings actually being able to visit it, like the Northern uninhabited islands here, hmm. is like, there have not been people to walk on some of these islands in years. And the ones that have, you know, have to take an incredibly long boat trip and they're just like wildlife, I don't know, maintenance type of people who have to like sort of island hop and camp out. It's very remote. There's only 55,000 people here. I brought my family here in, in April of 2020. That's 2020? Mm-hmm. Oh, you're April new. April of 2020. Kind of new there. Was this a it's in, pandemic it's thing? Interesting. Yes, absolutely. We were in Southern California and I started to see the things happening. I had been speaking about and writing about uh, a shift that was coming, the way that it was going to happen, sort of the 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 look that it was going to have, spiritu- sort of spiritually, I guess you could say, for years before that. And I saw this thing happen and I said, we're out. I know where this is going. I know exactly what this is. Um, it was by providence that... It's coming back. I, oh, that's I me. found out that this... Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. It was by Providence. Go ahead. Yes, it was by Providence that I had found out that this place even existed. And also that there was a small community of people who were basically like friends of friends who had already come here. Oh. Uh, related to related to software and cryptocurrency, which is my professional background. So I'm a Bitcoin developer is what I do. We We jumped on a plane. They ended up shutting this island down. Um, there aren't much medical services here. So the way that they approached the pandemic was to basically shut the island down. It's a uh, the Commonwealth, really. It's a big tourist sort of situation. Yeah. We came in on the last plane before they shut down all in- entrance. And How action. many folks is we in your family? Uh, it's my myself, my wife, and my, my two daughters. I have two young daughters. Nice. So that was so, a hell of a trip. Yes. Yes, it was. And we arrived basically, you know, we knew a few people because of the these sort of mutual connections, but we knew nothing about this place. Um, th- thankfully, I'm a software developer. So, you know, being able to have income coming in from anywhere in the world, I can work remotely. It's not a problem. And we we came and, you know, we ended up being in a place, as I was telling you before, alternate timeline where there was just no COVID here. It just didn't happen. Like the pandemic didn't happen here at all. I mean, literally at all. Like there were no cases. No masks right? and no cases. No, there were, there was, the mass situation is very interesting because um, although we are under a U.S. flag, ethnically, this place is basically Asian. So it's about 40% Filipino. Uh, it's about, I think it's about 20% uh, East Asian. So Korean, Japanese, Chinese. And then the rest of it is the uh, sort of what we would call locals here, but it's the indigenous population. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So do they have so a separate ch- language, an indigenous language? They do. They have two, actually, because there's the Chamorro people who are here, who are actually from the Mariana Islands. And then there are the Carolinian people who are from the islands uh, to the south, Palau, micro, and uh, Federated States of Micronesia, Chuk. Um, Yap, 
and they have integrated since the 1800s. There was a chief. They, their, one of the big islands there got blown up by a typhoon. The chief put everybody on boats and brought them here and asked the Chamorro if they Take could stay. Wow, wow. And they let them stay. And he's sort of viewed as the, the, this patriarchal hero of the Carolinians who are here. But the, the, the official languages here, so that you see on official documents, government buildings, is Carolinian, Chamorro, and English. Wow, they've transliterated it, and it, it's a working language. Okay. Yes, but, but one of the most common languages that you hear is Tagalog. So you actually will hear Filipino sometimes more often than you will hear English, depending on where you are, because it's 40% Filipino here. And you're a convert to Orthodoxy, and do they know what that is? Well, there's a there's actually a, a sizable Russian community here because it's not that far from Vladivostok. It's only about a three and a half hour flight from Vladivostok. Oh, so I they, see. yeah, that's right. You're right. And it's even it's even closer to Sakhalin. So there are basically Japanese looking people here who speak only Russian. And my wife is Russian. And so uh, she she's, hangs out with them. She's Asian and, Russian style or white Russian style or whatever that is, she, which we're going to talk about from, race because it's so stupid. <laughs> uh, my wife is from Samara. So she's she's blonde haired, dark eyes, but blonde haired. Um, but she has, you know, that sort of she's, she's from the south, southern Samara is pretty close to Kazakhstan. Yeah. So, you know, she doesn't burn in the sun. She yeah. gets very dark, very tan. She's got Turkish background. What's uh, your ethnic family, background, Father, um, Father Turbo? I promise we'll talk to you too. But oh, it's pretty interesting. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my father is is black, uh, but he's his family's relatively light skin, like Creole. They're Haitian. Mm -hmm. Like if you go back further, and uh, my mother's Mexican. Okay, yeah, man. I was telling Father, as people know who listen, sometimes I bring it up. Not often. I I married a black woman from from Harlem who became Orthodox uh, together. So our kids are different rainbow colors. I once got in bad <laughs> trouble for saying that. I was giving a talk at a university called Gonzaga. And I literally said, they're all the different many funny colors. And then all hell broke loose. I'll tell you about it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> like literally all hell broke loose. People started walking out. The whole, the oh. whole, the whole, listen to this. Nah, I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to get in trouble again. But the whole program was changed because I had offended the sensibilities of the <laughs> color of people of color there, which is ridiculous because I was trying to say the opposite. Anyway, keep going. So you guys know that he were you coming up in L.A. and an out of control person? And then the two of you are out of control together. And is there a cool, salacious story that we can half tell? Well, my, uh, I don't want to get into my own background, but my own background is one long salacious story. So I had, I had a life um, where I was pretty well known for my salaciousness, but I was out of that by the time that I got here. Uh -huh. um, and, I, you know, I'll make, a, I'll make a very long story short. We were here. I was seeing what was going on. Uh, I was really, it, it was because I had sort of known this was coming. I was, you know, in a deep state of sort of meditation, prayer, Christ had come back into my life after a long, long, you know, so I was ex exploring and, you know, I really began, I didn't know what I was doing, but I began, uh, you know, pray, getting back to praying very regularly and taking what I could. I, I didn't know anything about orthodoxy and it was just, it was in prayer that and really asking the Holy Spirit to teach me how to pray. Mm -hmm. You know, in this Saipan, was something that I was talking about. This was in Yes, Saipan. yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So you absolutely. weren't Orthodox and when you arrived. Got it. Got it. Not at all. Not at all. And in prayer, uh, and, you know, again, this is one of those things that it's just like, I just had to take it at face value. In prayer came to me this, basically, it was just, it was like I was being shouted and told exactly like, Hey, you're gonna you're a Bitcoin developer. You're gonna do this class. You're gonna call it Bitcoin Mystery School. You're gonna teach people about Bitcoin. Hmm. Go set it up. Go tell people that this is what you're doing. You're only gonna take 15 people per class. This is what you're gonna do. You're gonna do it once a month. And I was like, I don't even know what this is, <laughs> but I'd been praying. I'd been fasting. 
you know, for, for months up to that. And even as the pandemic started, I was in the middle of a fast in February. Like I did a seven day fast in February, 2020. Like just doing your um, own thing fast. My Figuring own thing, out. right? My own thing, not, you know, you know, reading what I could, looking at what I could, praying about it. And interestingly enough, you know, I, I put up that I was going to do this class and it was immediately reached out to by an Orthodox gentleman that I had talked to before, just somebody that I had sort of met online, fo- sort of followed me on social media. And he said, hey, I've got a bunch of guys who are in our parish. We've sort of seen the things that have coming I, that are coming. I'm aware of some of the things that oh, you've been I saying about it. Happened. We think that we're kind of in line with this. We think that, you know, being able to figure out how we can have an alternative economy when things we think things are going to get real tyrannical, learning about some of these things we think is important. Do you think we could be part of this class? And I said, well, I, you guys could actually be the first ones. <laughs> like, I'll give you an extreme discount on it. You guys can be my guinea pigs. And uh, th- this would be perfect for all of us. Now, and pause real quick. Pause. Go ahead. Pause. They just want to interject something. He can guys. fill in the blanks. <laughs> just something to understand real quick is that um for a good for a good year minimum at that point in time our community had been you know basically batting back and forth talks that cyprian had done before he was cyprian right because cyprian's his baptismal name right so when he was doing talks under vin armani we were putting we were batting back and forth talks that he had done Mm. And in those talks, we essentially, in a nutshell, were like, here's somebody who's seeing what we're seeing. He's, he's not good. orthodox. Mm-hmm. He's not orthodox, but he's seeing what he's saying. He's seeing what we are seeing, and he's articulating it in a way that most people aren't articulating it. So we were we were all batting back and forth, and... It wasn't even just the stuff of the pandemic. It even went back to one that he did on the Devouring Mother and just all these things mm. um, that we had been started tracking on. And then in a nutshell, then I'll pass it back to Cyprian. Um, we do what we do here. And we started praying for him by name. And so we would pray for him, you know. Straight through the internet connection. This was all internet still at this point. Yeah, we would get we well, we would get I love podcasts that. that he had done. But I mean, you knew him by name as an as a as somebody on a screen. Correct, correct. And we just started, we just started praying for him, and then essentially, the opportunity came, and the gentleman uh, Nikolai who reached out to him. I mean, that was all kind of part of the prayer. It wasn't like a meditated plan. It was just Bing, Bing, Bing. You know. Yeah, but sure. it's important to put that in there. That background is. We had been praying for him for quite some time, by again by name, leading up to this. Go ahead, Supreme. Wow. I mean, so they they had you got and adopted, actually, bro. You got adopted. Basically, <laughs> and it's it's interesting because Nikolai had said to me, because I had you know I had made public that yeah I'm I don't I don't know I guess I still kind of consider myself an atheist, but it looks like I'm an atheist who's praying every day to Christ. Like so, this is kind of it was even weird for me. Right. So it it was it was like, uh, what is what what am I doing? And and Nikolai had said to me, it said, well, you know, if you ever want to talk to a priest, um, you know, you you could totally reach out to to our priest. And I said, okay. And he he had mentioned some things about Father Turbo and his background. And I said, wow, this sounds like a really interesting priest. And I knew that they were Serbian Orthodox. And I said, okay, well, I don't know if I'm really at that 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 place. And it just lined up. That at the same time that sort of I met all of these gentlemen, and particularly you could imagine I didn't know anything about Father Turbo. And then his, you know, we're doing all of this. This is a remote class that I'm doing. And his camera comes on and here's Father Turbo that I see for the first time. And I'm like, from the Serbian Serbian, Orthodox Serbian (laughs) Orthodox priest. I was like, immediately I said, okay, something's very different here. (laughs) Right? Something's very different here. And there was also, I think importantly, there was also that connection because i am i am black yeah right so like i know i know that you said we could maybe talk about race a little bit it's not nothing right it's not it's not nothing to see somebody who looks who who looks like who looks like your father quite Mm -hmm. quite honestly right like it's that's not nothing there's some there's something to that 
in terms of a uh, rapport, trust, we can talk about it in a materialist way, right? But it's just like, you have an ability because you know, oh, there's a shared experience. Never mind that we're both from Southern California, which my family is as well, mm. right? So just even being able to speak and, you know, he'll mention a, a, a name of a city or a town or whatever. And it's like, I've not only have I been there, I've lived like yeah. blocks from there. You know what I mean? You were seeing all of your, the, your intuitions. They were all coming real in the form of a person who it's not like he's the answer, Father, I, no offense, but I get it. The imagery allowed you to have a home. I get it. That's real. Mm -hmm. that, that's real. That's, that, and that's, this is this, and this is why I say it's like, how, what are the chances, right? What are the chances that that's too, for me, it's like, that's, yeah. it's beyond coincidence. And so it just so happened that at that time, I had sort of hit a wall in terms of my prayer. And it was not even that I was getting diminishing returns, but I was getting what I now see as starting into spiritual delusion. I didn't understand what it was at that time, Ooh, but I've, yeah. I've been very involved in spiritual practice for a long time. And I can tell when I could tell that something had shifted and that it was less about what was coming from outside of me. And now things were starting to feel like they were sort of coming from inside of me. And so I asked Father Turbo, I said, Father, I don't know if you would be open to this, but uh, could you help me with my prayer? Because I think I've reached a, a place where I don't know what to do next. Hmm. And our relationship began uh, out of that. He, he very much helped me with my prayer. And then, as, then I really realized I can't do this outside of the church. I understood that I was approaching something uh, with, with my, my prayer that it was going to hurt me if I didn't have the, the armor or the framework or whatever you want to call it of the church. And so I said, I got to get it. I, I got to be in the church. And it was interesting that the same day that I wanted to talk to him about that, he actually, as he, he's done so many times said to me, you got to be in the church before I even said it to him. Is that you right. Know, there's been so, there's been so it's almost every time we talk <laughs> that he'll say, ah, this is what you need. And I'll say, Oh, that's what I called you to talk about. So let's, let's go ahead and talk. And, um, so is this how Royal, Royal Path, your the podcast that that's wacky and cool, is that it comes out of your guys' relationship? I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I maybe and maybe Andrew. that's enough. That's enough of me. I think maybe Father, do you want yeah, to take father. over the story yeah, from here? <laughs> I think yeah, I, I mean Cyprian. That's not enough, but it's a lot. <laughs> we'll come back it's, to you. I mean, <laughs> the one thing I would add to that though is just to kind of put the bow on it is. You know, I did fly out there, and we did baptize him. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and oh, you and, did? Yeah, this yeah. This is a beautiful brought, story. I yeah, didn't know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flew out there, baptized him, chrismated him, married him, and, and his wife. Gave him a church wedding. You know, and um, yeah, you know, uh, made their made the real connection. So I mean, it it's it's a real thing. It's a real thing. You know, and subsequently since then, I mean. You know, Cyprian's turned into quite the fisherman, you know, because since then, I mean, I, I've had contact with so many people through him. I mean, listen, if anyone's looking for the church, it doesn't matter where you're at. We, I mean, this whole story has proven that if you really want it, it'll happen. He connected me with a guy in, in Korea who had nothing, was dying to become Orthodox. He's like, I don't know how this is ever going to happen. Long story short, you know, I'm just giving him just a little bit of guidance here and there through, you know, uh, a chat app, praying for him. Next thing you know, you know, within a few, you know, about six months or so, he ended up getting catechized and then eventually baptized by the Metropolitan there in Korea. Wow. So, so this I is mean, this tool, right? This new world mm -hmm. thing, this, this, this techno tool, the internet, you, you guys... It doesn't sound like you could badmouth it. You know, on the on our podcast, we talk about new world, old world stuff. It doesn't feel like you guys would badmouth this tool. Or well, would you? How do you see it? Well, I do badmouth it in the sense of, um, I mean, this is kind of part of the story too. If If you try to find stuff about me prior to, I mean, really, there's really nothing there prior to 21 maybe is that right 20, 
Yeah, I mean, you'll find a couple talks here and there, but they're just, you know, kind of hidden and whatever. But I'm not, you know, like, you know, I, I have a Facebook. I'm not on it. I wasn't on it, you know. It, it was it was more like I'm literally one of those guys who just had it to maybe talk to my, mm-hmm. you know, talk to my aunt or my sister or maybe lurk on someone to see what, you know, see if they're okay. But I just stayed off of the stuff. Um, and so the what only do you think of yourself on there now? Well, here's the, this is, this is the thing. The only reason why I'm out now, like the reason why I'm doing this interview, is I basically have a, I have a policy now. I'm just out there out of obedience because my patriarch, Porfirie, he said, look, um, these are the rooftops of the age. We have to be out there. Wow. That's a brilliant phrase. Preaching the, preaching the gospel. And I'm not that guy. So, so I'm just going to tell you, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic or sensational. I say out, out of obedience, because, you know, like that was a directive that was given and most people probably didn't take it, but I can't explain it except for, you know, when the, when the shepherd speaks and I don't just mean, you know, his holiness, I mean, the master spoke through him and it was just one of those things. Cause you know, that's one of the ways you can recognize him. It's like, what's the cross. Yeah. So this being out there, I know it sounds crazy, people, but being out here and doing this, it's a cross for me because I, I don't like being exposed. I don't like being in the public square. I don't. I'm not really. You know, I'm not really one for trying to give, give opinions and things like that. I don't know. Oh, oh, there you're back. Usually, forgive me. I usually have good internet. I don't know what's going on, Father. I (laughs) tied. Oh, did you say I know what's going on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is it is it the demons? Hey, man, I just had the um, the uh, Iron Icon here. She just left two days ago. So, yeah, it's when she shows up, stuff happens. You guys so. speak speak to me then about this. So I I wouldn't say. You know, there's this orthodox corner of the internet, and I, uh, I'm really thankful to be a part of. You know, we do it in part to reach out to people for our nonprofit work. So, I I can't complain, but it's a weird thing going on. But what happens is, is a lot of people watch this old world, new world, and they'll see these orthodox folks come on like you guys, and there's this inclination to go, man, this is a lot of hooey. And or like, really, that's how you're going to read it. Why isn't what you're saying just coincidence? Is there a way to know that it's not coincidence? Is there is there a rational like Western New World approach? That'll allow you to make sense of what you guys are saying, because it sounds crazy. I know. I'm not saying I don't believe it. It sounds crazy. Can I can I speak to can I speak to this? So I, I can express how it's how it's occurred in my life as the further I've approached the orthodoxy, right? Because I'm, I mean, I'm an engineer by trade. So I'm naturally skeptical about any of that. I'm looking for some causal thing. But I will tell you, father came here, uh, father and a reader from church, who's my, uh, who's my godfather. So they both came out here, did services. That was June, 2021, beginning of June, I believe first week of June, if I'm not mistaken, right, father? Yeah. So less than 30 days, or maybe exactly 30 days. It's July 4th. July 4th, we're out at the beach, right? Now, I'll tell you one interesting thing about uh, Father's visit. And even Father noted it at the time, was the Russian community, you know, came and participated in the things that we were doing, came around, came to some of the services and whatnot, spoke with Father, right? It, and it had been a long time since an Orthodox priest had been here. As far as we knew, there had been no Orthodox services here ever. Wow. So this was the first time that there had been Orthodox services in this place. It's a very Catholic place, by the way. Very Catholic. But um, no no Orthodoxy. The Russian community was here, and even Father noted, he was like, you know, yes, I'm an Orthodox priest, so yes, there was that connection. But he's like, still, there wasn't the cultural connection, right? So it's like, Father doesn't speak Russian. He, and he even he noted that, and he was like, you know that thing. So <laughs> this <laughs> this thing. was where this is where things where my head exploded. Like thirty days 
30 days after that. And, you know, the, my, the friends of mine who were here also, ex like, they came to liturgy and they experienced it and they were very moved and they were like, then they started moving towards Orthodox. Oh, Young guys who had come here for kind of the same reasons I had. On July 4th, I was out at the beach with my family. Okay, so this is less than 30 days. July 4th, I'm out at the beach uh, with my family and it's like starting to get dark. We're going to go watch fireworks. I said, one last time, I'm going to take my little three-year-old out into the water. I get up, get up from the table where we're at. All my friends are there and my wife and my other daughter were sitting there. I get up from the table, take my three-year-old, go down to the water, start to play. The first time I turn around and look back at the table, sitting in my chair <laughs> that I had just left is a, a Orthodox priest in a, all black cassock with a giant pectoral cross and my head exploded. <laughs> and my, I look at my wife and she's weeping. You're kidding. She's weeping. She, really? I go back. He's, it's a Russian Orthodox priest sitting, speaking with my wife in Russian. And as, and I said, I, I, I couldn't, I, I was like, I was dumbstruck, right? That this had just happened. I said, Father, Father bless. I got his blessing. I sat down. We started talking. He says, listen, I am a, one of the very rare, like mission priests that is in the Russian Orthodox church. I have a, what's called a Metokian, which is something like an embassy mm -hmm. um, in Taiwan. I go on missions throughout the Pacific, but I had never come to Mariana Islands. I decided that I was going to come. It's during the, so this is July 4th. This is during the Apostles Fast. And he's okay? on this the beach. During the, <laughs> he said, no Russian priest has even passed. The last time he said, church records say, a Russian priest passed by on a boat was 200 years ago. He said, no Russian Orthodox priest has been to this place, set down on this island, he said, I just got in, and this was the first place I came. No way. And my wife saw him walking by and said, oh, she didn't even, father, father. And then he, he came and sat down. And my friend's jaws were on the floor. These were guys who the first this time was they had experienced This a month before it. you had been Becca's 30 days. married and everything, yeah. Thir no, a month after. A month, month about after. a month Sorry. before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so this, this happened a month after. <laughs> Their jaws were on the floor. Right. And I was like, I don't understand. This doesn't make. And even they were like, I don't. One of them said, this doesn't make any sense. This can't happen right now. Or like, it makes a ton of, of sense. This. And his so, exact words, he didn't flinch. He did not flinch. He said, that is how you know that you are dealing with the true church of Christ. He said, because when Christ is involved, all of the laws of probability and everything don't exist anymore. He said, this is how you know. And that was, the for me, there have been many, many things that have happened like that. But for me, also what happened after that was, now the exact thing that Father had said was missing, Christ provided. Yeah. So they all, the Russian community came back around, and now they could have a conversation all in Russian with a Russian priest 30 oh, days I later. See. Yeah, it packed. So 30 days later. <laughs> so that has its own... Logos, it has its own spirit and rationality. That's all right. of that yes. has, so there's no coincidences. Now, no. if you really take that all the way out, guys, Father, if you take that all the way out, there's no coincidences, then wow, that's freakish, right? Now, everything you're seeing is actually a story. If you pay attention, wow, yeah. but we don't do that or something. We've been trained out of that. Well, that's why we worship. That's why I worship because. What is the what is the proper response to that? How do you re, how do you respond to something like that? You respond by giving your whole yeah. life as a sacrifice. You you create beautiful things. You offer beautiful prayers. You you forego beautiful things like food and sex for a period of time, not because they're bad, but because yeah. there's something higher, right? And, and in alignment, and, to put it in, in alignment, alignment. Yeah. And, and you worship. Wow. That's that's the response, you know. And when you when you worship and you give yourself over to the living God and the logos, you know, the ordering of reality, it, it everything gets reordered. Mm. So so the things that don't make sense, they begin to make perfect sense. This is why when Saint Paul talks about the natural man doesn't understand the things of the spirit, 
once you're in the spirit, everything begins to make sense, but you understand also that it's completely, you know, upside down and improbable from a worldly, or we could say, you know, Western perspective, it's just, you know, the, it's gorgeous. It's you know, gorgeous. I, I'm reminded of the Greek understanding of to be remembered, to be put back together, which is what we're doing at, at on Sunday or on at, at the liturgy. Everything's being remembered, reordered in a certain way, ordered again. The other thing is, because I'm cheesy and this is this is the light part, is it's Neo picking the bullets out as they're coming at him at the very end <laughs> yeah. of the Matrix. He's like that is nothing forgive me <laughs> like that's not you only think that's what it is wow that's right. yeah yeah man that's right but we that's can't right. stay in this space because we're fallen why can't this be a continual joy i guess for some it is or nearly is right yeah it's pride it's pride yeah. because the reality of, of facing it means that there's something beyond our cap our ability to control it to anticipate it, you know, to be um, impervious to it, right? And so the vulnerability that it calls you to, we don't like it. And that's why, you know, the the experience of light, because beauty, right? Light, beauty is, you know, light and beauty are synonymous, right? And so when you're exposed to light, it depends on your orientation. You know, like I always tell people, you know, I got eight kids, right? And so, when my three-year-old is having a nightmare and I walk into the room and I turn the light on, what happens? You know, he gets comforted. Yeah, he, can yeah. see, he can see his dad, you know? Well, you know, I've also had it rough and I've lived in places with roaches. And I got to tell you, same house, you go downstairs, turn the light on in the kitchen, <laughs> right? The roaches you know, scatter. You don't want that light on. <laughs> you don't want that light on, right? Did the light change? No, that's... It's yeah. the same light in the house. It's the orientation to the light, mm. you know? And so that's the thing is if, if I see it all the time, John, you know what I mean? As a spiritual father, I, I mean, I, I see it all the time as a human being in my own life, in my own experience. You know, the thing is, is uh, the tradition, orthodoxy is teaching me not to flinch. It, it's I, teaching me, it's teaching me to embrace the light when it's, when it, when it exposes me. But this is the assesses. This is the asceticism yeah. is don't flinch. Come on, bro. Don't, don't flinch. flinch. Don't yes. Flinch. Because it, it can be boiled down almost to that phrase, which is don't flinch. Yeah. We're going to do this five hour vigil. Don't flinch. Mm -hmm. We're going to go through this fasting period, but the cake, the reward is coming, but don't yeah. flinch. Don't, yeah. oh, forgive like me, that. John. Forgive me. Forgive me. I just want to say this for your people who are listening or orthodox because they don't know about a vigil. They don't know about fasting, really. But I can tell you this: don't flinch when you're called out on your stuff. Mm -hmm. Don't don't flinch when you when you actually see that your motivations that you're not a good person. Mm -hmm. You think that you're doing something because you love people. You don't love people. You're vain. You think that you're doing this because you know you have ideas and this. And that. You're not. You know you want to be recognized or you have bitterness. You have envy. All those. Things. That's when that's exposed, and that's why people run from Christ. You know what I mean? But that, but that's also the secret because when you lean into that thing, that's when, that's when, you know, you're fine. When you, you are finding him, that that's how, you know, anything that soothes you initially without a price, beware of that light. It's a false light. So then you guys do this podcast. <laughs> it must be, sorry. I don't even know how to, how does one pivot out of what, what do we do there? I think we just, so we just hit stop. Bye. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night, Greenville. Lord. Wow. That, guys, I'm not kidding. That was. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> cut. Jeremy, cut. Because I just don't know what to say. Thank God, though. I'm not kidding. Thank God. Don't cut it because I'm embarrassed, but I don't care. Oh, <laughs> Lord. That just happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we did the world path, right? <laughs> Cute, man. Well, I, I will cute. say, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, say maybe, something. Yeah. So, so I will say that this, this was for me the very painful therapeutic uh, process, and why, and I think really why I was reaching out to Christ was because, I mean, I don't know whether I mentioned this before we started talking or at the beginning of, what, of of when we did, but my my, you know, my previous life, I had reached a let's say in terms of what is valued by 
people in the world in terms of fame, money, these sorts of things. I had reached, you know, into the elite level because of, but very much because of my debauchery, like pure wickedness. And it had, I, I say that my wife and my daughter, who are both Orthodox, right? But way before I was, both my children were baptized, you know, Russian Orthodox <laughs> before, wow. and my wife never pushed it on me. But that was my first time being in a, uh, an Orthodox church. Was oh, the I baptism see. You of, were doing my the satellite daughter. thing. You were hanging around. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and it's nothing that my wife ever pushed on me, although I'm sure her mother was praying for me <laughs> and probably my wife as well. But uh, the, it it that I, I say that they saved my life, but very much it was I recognized and I saw that in order for me to pull fully out of this spiral that was destroying me and not to destroy my children my family which i which became more important to me that was really what it was was that mm -hmm. i had something that was more important than mm -hmm. all of these things that i had been told were the most important things fame money notoriety being the center of the the, the network in terms of culture having people stop you on the street and want pictures with you this type of thing mm -hmm. right that in order to to pull from out of that like i was going to have to shed and not just shed, but I was really going to have to, you know, I was going to have to kill the, the that old man. Yeah. And then it was the question of, then what is left, right? Who is what is what is left? And and I just realized it, it was it was an absolute blessing that I got to. You asked me before we started if I was in exile, and I would say in some ways I'm in a self imposed exile, but but maybe it's more of a cocoon, right? To be re, to be reborn, that like the caterpillar had to die. And so that required a change that was so stark and profound, and it couldn't be more profound than than coming to a place that nobody even knows exists that has a complete. And Father's been here. It's not like anywhere you're ever going to go on every level. But and so wow. But it's consistent and so, with the poetry of your life. It 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 is in the fact that I had to like I had to become new. I had to, sh and part of that shedding was. I need to be confronted with how wicked the things that I was do the how wicked the things I was doing were. Um and it's it's I, I think it's only in the light of Christ because like how how would anybody be able to be confronted by that if they weren't being confronted by the thing that's higher? I, mean, I guess what I, I'm saying to follow up on Father there. If I could jump in on something too, forgive me, Cyprian and John. I, I just want to kind of like just do my job right now I kind of highlight some things because you know a cocoon is good you know you know being a new creation in Christ but I think it's more appropriate to say in the same sense that well in a similar sense in the same spirit in which you know the apostle Paul was Saul and was struck down and then in that moment of time blinded and then through this time of being blinded and, and Ultimately, you know, Paul goes into this exile. He goes into Saudi Arabia for like seven years or something. You don't hear anything, you know? And and Paul's repentance mm. of persecuting Christ, Paul's repentance of, of idolizing his, his culture, his nation, his education, right? All those things, you know, Paul's theology tears all those things down. That's his repentance. That, that's one of the things that you don't hear about when we go through the work of Paul, people lose sight of, well, why is Paul like this and Paul's like that? People don't understand because what they don't understand is Paul is hitting those things about the natural man, hitting those things about the things that people can boast in because that's his repentance. That's why Paul's all about, I don't, you know, I know nothing but Christ and him crucified because you weren't going to get any higher than Paul was as a Jew, educated and baptized in the eighth day, tribe of Benjamin, under Gamaliel, the greatest rabbi of the time, and on top of that, a Roman citizen. Mm -hmm. He had all the boxes checked. And so that's why he says, I counted all as rubbish for the sake of Christ. That's his repentance. So God calling Cyprian and, you know, bringing him to this place of exile, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, this is, you know, there's this wonderful saint, if your people aren't aware of him, his name is Saint Sophroni. Real, real deep, you know, you got to get someone to kind of walk you through it. If you're not, if you don't know much about stuff, he's so deep. And he talks about this thing, the hypostatic principle, which is 
essentially, you know, Christ is the man. He is the archetype. His, his story is the story. And so you find authentic personhood when you begin to line up your life story with his story. That's the hypostatic principle, right? So you can now apply that to anyone. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. You, you can take the life of St. John, of, you know, St. John the Climacus, St. John the Baptist, you know, St. Paul, any of the saints, because they're in Christ. And you can now line your life up to the saint and begin to see what is blessed, what isn't blessed. What is the pattern that is being established? Now let me follow the pattern. And so that's what Cyprian has been doing. And, you know, he was a, you know, uh, a promoter of salaciousness. Forgive me, Cyprian, I love you. But he was a, he was a promoter. He was a promoter of salaciousness and filth. He, he had national recognition for being, a, you know, being, being filthy. And so now the repentance is taking that platform and now repenting and, and, and promoting wisdom and repentance and life, all these things, right? Being known and then, and then coming into exile, right? The, the, the repentance is it's, that, I mean, that's what's going down. Well, it's know? the eternal pattern, which is also the cross. Which is also resurrection. Wow. That's right. That's Man, right. That's will you guys right. give me one second? I'm just going to say this so that my guys can cut in and add, and then this is, we'll continue. Uh, let's take a break for one second and hear from Molly. Molly, talking, this is the section, this is the new thing I told you about that you wanted to be a part of called Two Minutes with Molly. Yes, this is our infomercial. This is you giving us an update on life from the West Coast and from the viewpoint of a First Things Foundation supporter who also recently got back from Georgia. You have two minutes. Two minutes with Molly. Dun -dun. Are we going to have like a two minute intro? And then that can just be it. Just the theme <laughs> That's song. That's it. Right just there. the same song and cut yeah it should just be um like the two minute commercial plea for like please send more money so that the field workers can eat i think that that would work do you think that you appearing on two minutes with molly and we're now down to one minute and 38 seconds but do you Lordy. think two minutes with molly could help us to raise more money that's what i think well, if if I can be brutally honest, yeah, I think so. Does Tim, your husband, support you on two minutes with Molly? I think so. As long as I probably don't bring shame to the family, I'll be okay. <laughs> so far, it's just medium shame, I think. Medium shame, right. But then when I tell everybody that currently my computer is sitting on an ironing board, I feel like that's... You I want to see the metrics, though. The metrics of how your your two minutes with Molly impacts. Yeah, donors. like I want to see like that donor increase because I said you don't really need to shop on Amazon Prime Days. What you really need to do is give that money. The first thing. All right, guys, this is so good. I'm not kidding. This is um, you guys know when you do your podcast, there's like good ones, and then you're like whatever. You can already tell this chassis is built strong. We can go a long time. Can we, <laughs> can, can, can we try um, race for a second? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Jeremy, let's cut it however you wanted, but let's just start again. So, guys, all right, I, got, I want to go two different directions. I'm, I always have this weird secular ear. It's probably because I haven't shed properly all all the things that I was and maybe all the things I don't want, maybe, maybe take them with me. All these, cause I have a, I don't know if I was that salacious. I don't even know what that means. Cause we're all sort of either asleep or awake on some level and we're waking up. Right. Um, but I always want, I, I, I want to hear what the non-believers are saying for some reason that interests me. I guess it's a missionary tool or something. It's uh -huh. just a part of who I am. Sure. So, when you go this direction, you get over into these identities about who we are that seem to be 
the way that we, in the secular world anyway, the way that we're trying to gain salvation. You guys are talking about an eternal pattern. Mm -hmm. And I think in the new world right now, we're locked in this very, very, very um, um, non-eternal or uh, a corporal, deadly type of pattern where our identity is in our physical being at this moment, temporally in this world. And so with that, when we don't believe in eternal life, what happens is, is we latch onto identities, including race. So here we are. Of course, the Orthodox priest is black, but I hate this conversation for that reason. But I do think, like you said at the beginning, Cyprian, there is something to it. So what is there about race that we should pay attention to in 2022? And what maybe is the problem with it? as two two brown guys trying to figure out their way in the world. What do you guys think? Well, um, forgive me, I'm, I'm going to start with, you know, kind of home court press a little bit, and then I'll try to move outwards from that. But from, from our kind of, you know, lexicon, it would be idolatry, right? So it's idolatry. So um, just to kind of break something down for people, when, when people hear idolatry, they think of, you know, people bowing down to little gold statues of something and praying for it and, and asking for it, right? But when we say idolatry, um, it can be that, but more often than not, it has everything to do with, you know, your identity, you know, whether that is, you know, your sexual prowess, um, where you come from, what you do, you know what I mean? Um, uh, what brings, what you think brings you some sort of security or joy, so I think the thing is the, the problem is idolatry and it and it separates you from from rea from the reality which is God right and, reality. and that reality let me just say this is important that reality isn't necessarily just some sort of like abstract thing like the force like when we talk about God a lot of people they're thinking Star Wars they're thinking midi chlorines and the force and you know this and that and it, and there's an aspect to it like that for sure, but it has a lot more to do with the person who's right next to you. And, and I think that's one of the things that, that a lot of people um, are, are missing when we begin to get into things like that, because idolatry, you know, and then breaking it down into identity, what it does is it may coalesce certain people but the way that most people enter into it, it, it by nature excludes the majority, hmm. right? And so when you begin to understand that, you know, like we're Catholic, small C, not, not capital C, you know, like Roman Catholic, but, you know, Catholic meaning universal and whole. That's, that's we believe. So, you know, my, my parish, my community here is in Kansas City on the east side, okay? Real quick, Kansas City is hyper-segregated. And it's basically broken down. The West side is white and wealthy and the East side is not. And so, you know, I, there's inner, there's interspersings here and there, you know what I mean? And there's plenty of quote unquote white folk and Brown folk on the East side and there's black folk on the West side, but you get what I'm saying? Like sure. you, you see the difference. So our parish is on the East side. Our parish is in a bad neighborhood. Right. Um, and from my perspective, if a guy here in the city where I'm at, can't become orthodox then it's not the truth because because the truth has to speak to the human condition and so the human condition finds itself incarnate in every aspect so when you begin to understand that then it's a lot easier to begin to enter into well what are the what is the value of, of identity then because it has a role yeah. Yeah. and so and so the problem is you know, people go too much to the left or to the right. They don't. They don't stay on a real path. They don't stay in that in that space where there's truth. So, on the left, you know, and, and you know, pun intended. This 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 is you know, on the left, not just politically, but there's a whole other connotation to how we understand the left, a left hand temptation. But the left is to say, you know, well now in, in 20, because actually it was different. A lot of, what a lot of people don't remember is. Conversations about race are, you know, when you're thinking like 2010 and back. Oh, I know. What everything you're... changed. And a lot of people don't know 2013, 14, 15, things changed. Correct. In regards to the conversation of race. 
So, you know, 2010 and back, it was all about, hey, you know, there's no color, colorblind, all this stuff, whatever. And then it began to kind of come in focus in, a, in an interesting way. So there's these, there's been these shifts where, you know, people will say like, you know, identity isn't anything, but then it becomes everything. It becomes the means by which, you know, you mm -hmm. find who you can be, who you can be with and how you can be. But then the other side of it is to say like, you know, um, oh, people, you know, they're kind of twisting it and there aren't these problems. There, there's problems, right? So, but I think when people are either putting too much in a, of an emphasis in the wrong way or they're denying the emphasis in the wrong way, they're both coming from a place of, of idolatry mm -hmm. because they're, they're not understanding the issue and their perspective in the context of the whole, meaning other people, other ethnicities, that everything doesn't exist just from your context. That's right. There's layers and layers and layers of reality. Mm -hmm. We're stuck in one instead right. of transcending on some level. Yeah, that makes sense. That's right. I wonder I wonder if one way to break that, and I try to do this with my girls. I have four girls, Father, and I know that you have a lot of kids. Some of them may be males. <laughs> yeah. And so we should talk off camera. We should do some <laughs> old school, old world <laughs> marriage bartering. Want to? Yeah. <laughs> you got a dowry? Yeah, I want a dowry. You got it. Well, wait, wait. It depends which culture we're coming from, but I'll take I'll take the dough. Geez, am I in trouble? Let's not put this, let's not publish this one. Let's edit that. Okay, so here's my point. <laughs> is uh um I I wonder though if any of this can be fixed until some sort of new God emerges that allows for a transcendence. And I th there could be a devil that emerges, but something that unifies us, which allows us to see again, or to see once again, not the temporal and not the material. We get past it. Like, I think we're stuck in the temporal and race becomes super important because we're atheists, fundamentally. We, we can't imagine something else. The question is, is what's the other thing going to be? Maybe it's, maybe it's Christ. I don't think so, John. I don't either. And, and I want to say it just because, you know, again, it's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm out here in the, on the interwebs. Because I, be, I feel very strongly to try to, with in all humility, I know that that sounds like a weird phrase, but to say, no, I, I have a strong conviction that there's things that people, there's blind spots that a lot of people have and they're, they're dangerous blind, blind spots. We're on a, we're, it feels like, we're on some sort of count, you know, countdown and, you know, things are moving in such a way that like, you know, I feel a, a burden to say, look out for these traps because mm -hmm. what happens is people can be blind to something, but then there comes a point where the snare, the fowler, you know, it trips and, and you're, and you're stuck. And, and I think that I know, I know it's not a thing. I know that this issue of race, identity, idolatry is one of them because I've seen it. Because, look, there isn't too many people who you're going to rap with that have that can say, you know, they have close people, and I mean close people who have come out of you know a white supremacist background. You know what I mean? The long time ago, which this is a whole nother conversation, but before being a priest, you know, I was a tattoo artist for you know twenty years. And the guy who apprenticed me was a white supremacist. Hmm. Right? That's a whole story in of itself. You know what I mean? Uh, I got a godson who, when I first met with him, he was, you know, getting into that white supremacy subculture. Wow. I, I, can, I can go on and on about it. So the thing about it is, is that, number one, people can repent and change. That's the first thing to understand. But the other thing to understand is that it's a very strong pull. And this this race identity idolatry thing. It's very strong. It's very strong. And it's only gotten stronger. It's only gotten stronger. And it doesn't, and here's the thing that people don't want to hear a lot of times. In fact, I know they don't, right? Um, it goes both ways. In fact, in fact, I'm I'm gonna say it. Um <laughs> black folk, particularly African American folk, I say that not to be politically correct, I say it because. African-Americans, Black-Americans have a have a different kind of 
uh, Lo gives me a different kind of temptation than someone does from Eritrea or Ethiopia or even Jamaica or Haiti because because of culture, right? Because what happens is if you talk to someone from Ghana, from Nigeria, right? You go like they'll have the they'll have the foundation of culture, which like are you Igbo? Where are you from? Like what's your tribe? They'll have language. They'll have all these things which Europeans have, which right. you know Asians will have, right? And so on that end, it's like, it's a different thing. That That's why the, the Black American, African American experience is so unique in the sense that, yes, being African has a part to play in it. I, I'm not undermining that. Yes, you know, slavery has a part to play into. I'm under, not undermining that. But it's it's the removal of having a sense of culture. And the reason why I say that is because Irish were slaves. But there was a there was a measure of culture that they were able to kind of maintain that's right. Which allowed which allowed them as a people group to maintain some of their inner forces, some of their um, some of their soul on a collective level. Does that make does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. So, Cyprian, before I got a question for you on this, but before sure. I do that, just really one and a half quick points. One is, I saw we see that all the time in Africa. I took my wife, African American back to Africa after I'd lived there. I spoke the local language. She did not. And I took her around. We went Ghana, Mali. I lived in Mali. We went to all the we, everywhere you can, we went and everyone had the same reaction. They would speak to her as soon as she didn't speak their language. And they saw that I did. She became like person non grata. Her color was very, very, very little yep. interest to them. Almost yep. none. But the question was, who's your family? Right. And she said, I don't know my family. I wouldn't say she was dead to them, but she was like, um, ah, it was like a sad thing. And they would tell yeah. me in Bambara, they would tell me, like, hey, Che, you mind that? Like, that's tough. Like, what is, how does she go to bed at night? Like, how does she know? I'm like, you're the guys who sold her. Right. <laughs> and they that's actually right. said, they actually said, you got sold by the Temne. So there was this guy who said, he knew his business, he knew how to, his history. And he said, I bet your people got sold by the Temne. That could make you a manding. And then mm -hmm. how fascinating is that? He said yeah. that without yeah. guile. He's like, so. Right, right. Wild. Right. Yeah. 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 And the second thing I'd say is as for my daughters, and then Cyprian, I got this question for you. Okay. My my daughters, we raised them to, we would say you're this, but you're Orthodox. We always tried to make their identity the next highest thing or really the highest thing. Mm -hmm. Now, did it work? Yeah, but then they all went to college. <laughs> and then race became uh -huh. a whole different conversation. So Cyprian, how, 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 how do you do it in, in Saipan? And how, what's it become known to you as a mixed guy, whatever, which is also ridiculous. Everybody's mixed, but you get my point. Uh, in, in the American lexicon, you're, you're mixed or whatever. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that in Saipan? And how have you dealt with that with your wife in an interracial marriage? How does it look? Well, this is a, uh, I mean, my wife and I met in Vegas. I was living in Vegas. She was in Vegas at the time. And if there's any place <laughs> in America, I think that is like where race is really nobody cares, um, especially because it's the casino industry, right? A, a lot the mobsters and things like even the history Dollars. there was known for. If you could make money, I mean, look at the Rat Pack, right? Sammy Davis, like the whole. It's like who cares that he's black, right? He's a member of the Rat Pack. Like he gets carte blanche and so it's like if you can make somebody money they don't care yeah. right if the casinos they don't care and you know it's an embrace of like well i would hope that you would have all these different shapes and sizes and colors and that, that's part of the thing right so yeah you're right that's part of the for, attraction so, mm -hmm. yeah so for us establishing a relationship i mean my, my wife is is russian her english is not fantastic you know what I mean? It's 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 good, but she likes to be around Russians and she's she's self-conscious about that. Um, but she's I mean, she's blonde haired. She's white. But, you know, she doesn't feel fully comfortable in like her race means nothing, like you say, because of the language situation. Yes. Like you speak with her, you immediately know, oh, this is not an American woman. Right. She's Russian. Never mind what's going on right now. Right to where there's Russophobia. Oh, oh, People don't yeah, think about, oh, what would it be like to be a white person, very undeniably white, but yet you're discriminated against. She's been discriminated against constantly, 
I mean, since not the bad war. since the war. No, or just since in general, since yeah. Trump, Trump coming in. Oh, Let's yeah. be real, right? Like that brought it all to the fore. I mean, to the point where for us to go and get our our daughters dealt with with the citizenship with the embassies, right? Trump started shutting down all the embassies. We had to travel all over the place and do all of this. So it's like, well, that was happening to Russians, but it wasn't happening to, to anybody else. And she's an American citizen, right? So it's like, but she also happens to have this bond. I mean, for, for I, this is something that I've been used to growing up because being black and Mexican, but also both sides of my family, very educated, being from Southern California. So I don't have, I have a California accent. You know what I mean? People talk to me on the phone. They're like, ah, oh, I think you're, you, right. you must be white or whatever. You know what I mean? So it made you so, less racial or more interested in your race? It's both. It's both. Because, I mean, I also went to historically black university, right? I went oh, to Howard University. Oh. And so it's like, you know, when people, when people like you, when they like me, if they're, Latino, they're like, oh, he's Mexican, right? If they're, uh, if, if they're black, they're like, oh, he's black. If they don't like me, you're not black. You're not Latino. You know what I mean? Ooh. So it's like, it's completely subjective. Yeah. What, what do people think of you? I wish they could say it to me, but I'm too dark. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that, that's actually something I want to say is you got this weird passing ability. Yep, Super, for sure. But, but all three of us have been probably asked the question about race on some level with just, I'm mm -hmm. talking about with a friend. I'm guessing all three of us elevate orthodoxy on some level. Now I do. I know father, mm -hmm. you must like, yeah, I'm black, but Cyprian, I'm black, but mm -hmm. when you give him the, but you know, there's a transcendent identity and it's in Christ or whatever. It's my mm -hmm. orthodoxy. What's the reaction? Well, uh, I mean, if I, if I could, I just want to say I've been doing that before I was Orthodox. I've been doing same, that. Same, 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 same. Yeah. Because the thing is, I, I'm, I'm a subculture kid. So all that trained me to become Orthodox in many ways. I mean, because that, that, you know, to give you kind of like a little peek of how identity works, it's like things are kind of changing right now in the Orthodox world a little bit mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. But I went through seasons like, oh, Black priest. Okay, let's talk to the Black, black priest. Let's get you to talk here and there that, about yeah. that. But then there's a season where it's like, oh, you're you are the you're the um the subculture priest. You're the guy who was like, you know, into punk rock, or you were the guy who was into the occult, or you you know what I mean? So it's like there are these things that people look at and like, okay, so that's kind of like your you know, your, your subculture, your shtick or whatever mm -hmm. it is, right? So before being a priest, before being orthodox, I was, you know, I mean, I, I was an I was an artist. And that's where my wife and I met, and it was like you know, it's a real thing being able to have a greater measure of moving outside of those confines. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a story. My wife and I went to buy a minivan. I can't remember what year this was, but, you know, I mean, I think we had three kids at the time. So it's like a while ago. I got to like now. a year ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. So we're, we're buying this van. And um, at this point in my life, besides the fact of, you know, kind of being tattooed, you know, I mean... I've always been kind of like a snazzy dresser. I, I can't help it, whatever. But like it, nothing wild like I used to be. You know what I mean? And we're sitting down. And it, this is how it usually goes for me. People look at me. They have a thought. I'm, I'm a big guy. You know, I'm 6'2". You know, two, two, you know, I always hover between 260 and 290. That's just like where I'm always at, right? And so you're, you're a big, big, guy. Guy, big guy, whatever. And so there's always an initial impression. But the thing that happens as soon as I open my mouth, it's like, huh. So I'm I'm in this car lot, and the people they were uh, uh, they were Persians, you know, they're from uh, from Iran, you know what I mean? Speaking Farsi, you know, and even the fact that I know what Farsi is, you know what I mean? Like that throws people off. So big time. So we're talking, you know, and and the the lady of this the husband is doing my paperwork, and the wife looks to me. She says, "Where are you? Where are you from?" And I go, oh, yeah, I'm from Garden Grove, you know, and sitting in um, Southern California. And she's like, no, no, no. But like, where, where, where's your, your family from? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my mom's from Seattle. My dad's from uh, Santa Monica, originally from, <laughs> from you know, Arkansas. She's like, no, 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 no. Like, where are you? You from, though? And I was like, yeah, I told you, no, you're, you're not an American. 
Yes. And and I was like, huh? She's like, no, you you can't be an American. Like, you speak too well. You know, you're obviously educated. This and that. So like, she 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 wanted to say you you're not black. Right. She wanted to think I was going to say, oh, I'm from my family's from Nigeria yep. or my family's from Ghana or like or maybe I'm Jama- You know what I mean? She wanted to hear something like that, right? But if you have certain aspects, whether it's education, and I don't mean just education like you got a piece of paper, but me coming up through subculture, being able to talk to people about things, whether it's art or music that's outside of what the stereotype is, that's a type of education. And it does transcend things. And that's why, you know, especially for, for the last few years, roughly from like 2019 till now, you know, I've, I've, I've garnered a, a nice kind of following of people who are, let's just say, frustrated with me because I'm calling certain things out in regards of the black community in that sense, because I'm like, look, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. People don't want to hear the truth of taking responsibility. I don't mean like Bill Cosby, pull up your pants like that. I mean, like, <laughs> look, I'm, t- I'm telling you from experience, you know, because I've been grimy, (laughs) you know what I mean? I've I've been grimy, I've been there. So when I'm telling, I'm telling people from experience, not something I've read in a book. If you actually look to go outside of yourself and you, and you garner some, some of these social skills, what you'll find is, is that you can actually move, move to a greater degree than you realize outside of those bars of stereotype, because I'm a walking stereotype. People look at me, and it's just like boom, they think they got me pegged. But if I, if you just give me three minutes, I'll I'll, I'll bring it down. Right? Yeah. People yeah. don't understand. That's a reality. But you're that, describing the nature of the spiritual life. Once you enter into it, you can go anywhere. You can go wherever you want in the sense that you you're no longer bound except by the idea of the spirit or whatever God it is you're worshiping. It's really interesting. You're free in the sense that. You're not John, bound. You're not bound. Me. Forgive me. I, forgive me. I, I'm probably the freest man I know. I'm the freest man I know. I'll trade nothing for it. Well, here we are getting to talk to you. And Cyprian, you guys are pals. So what happens? I, I got You guys do these longer. Po- I can't keep going, guys. I got to stop at some point. I don't want to, though. I want to talk more. I just find this whole conversation very interesting. Will you guys um, consider another chat? Part two. Yeah. Uh oh, I think you're muted, you're on mute. Cyprian. Wow, I I I muted myself. I I did I I did I didn't even know I was I was over here like wait a minute wait a minute. Um, <laughs> no, I mean I if 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 you have if you have a couple of minutes just on this note, I you please, know you answering please. uh you know orthodoxy as an identity, it's been absolutely fascinating being here because uh, orthodoxy has actually become I think for most people that I interact with here my most important identity. Mm. Um, here, which has been weird and it's been very organic. It's not even been something that I've been pushing very hard, but it will come up in conversation and it seems to be the thing that people lock into. And the reason why is it's particular to this place, but I'm sure there are other places in the world that are like that. And it's because the, the structure of power here, political power, financial power, is very concentrated amongst the indigenous elites. So although this is a, a U.S. territory, um, it is not a spoil of war. They have a covenant with the United States and their own constitution. And the people in power here are the local people to the point where if you are not of the descent, even an American citizen, they're all American citizens. If you're born here, you're an American citizen. If you are not of Marianas descent, you cannot own land here. Wow. You cannot own land at all. And the the so, you know, the white, mainlanders right white americans that are here you almost never see them like father can attest to that like you'll just travel around you won't see white people Hmm. right and when you see mainlanders you'll they're usually going to be working for the government as either they work for like fema repairing stuff that goes in the typhoons they're lawyers for like the attorney general's office they're doctors in the hospital 
that's pretty much who, who comes here, right? Um, and, but if you want to do business here, which I'm an entrepreneur, if you want to do business or you want to interact in any way, you know, financially interact as an entrepreneur, at, mo at, at most, you know, you could run a little shop which the Filipinos and the Chinese do. But if you want to operate at any higher level and you're not inside, there's only inside and outside. Interesting. Right here, there's only inside and outside. And for if you're, if you're an outsider, your race doesn't really even matter. What about your orthodoxy? Your relationship. How do they respond that's when it. you say that's my so, identity? So this is the key. It's a very Catholic place, but they all recognize that the, that the, and my daughter goes to the Catholic school here because there is no Orthodox school. Right. But they all, they all recognize orthodoxy as respected by the Catholic Church as a true church, right? They're Vatican II people, right? Which it's laid out in Vatican II. Eastern Orthodoxy is a true church, oh, right? So, see. like, for instance, when there was some talk here of them, like, mandating that kids would have the COVID uh, shot, which they never did, right? But mandating that they would get that injection, you know, me giving to the, the director of the health department, you know, the, the stuff that was coming from Father Peter Hears, right? About yeah. like, here's the exemption. Here's what it's being said. I got an immediate call like, you will not be forced to do this. We understand. We oh, accept this. it works this. in your favor. Oh, and it's like, and when I speak with people and they find out that I'm Orthodox, you know, what I've noticed is that the people on the inside who are willing to work with me, immediately the trust level goes through the roof. The doors open because they're like, oh, this is like a real Christian practicing and people find out you know when i say oh i can't do that right now because we're fasting right and they don't they, they, they don't come at you yeah they, no they yeah. find out that you know we do typica on sundays here they're like oh this is actually observant person okay we can do business with him that's right okay we can interact with him okay there's the, we have immediate trust because you know mainlanders will come and they're like oh he's he's probably why is he here right well why is he escaping the mainland what's he trying to do but when they find out that i'm Orthodox and, and practicing. So it still has like, cachet. Okay. It has cachet in Saipan. Huge. It's, I, I think that there is nothing bigger that I could have as an identity of value in this society than that as an outsider. I think you're describing one of the things that I've spoken of on these podcasts a lot, and I see it over and over when I travel uh, for the work, is the old world values what you believe. Now, they may have a multiplicity of beliefs in one space and you might call it idolatry you know i don't i don't know but the idea that you believe it, it matters in in the new world eh, it's almost like it's almost like an irritation it's like a hair suit like take that off of me let's just talk yeah. about something else you know um that's cool that that you were seeing that we see that too where our guys work they can say what their religion is they can say what they believe and no one really get comes at them. I mean, I just want to say this too before you before we bounce out of it to complete the topic. But I mean, I remember this thing came very very clear to me. It was like two thousand four, two thousand maybe two thousand five around there, two thousand six. But I went to um, as a priest, Father Moses Barry, which you 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 know you may not know. I know Father Moses. Here. And uh, it's my first time going to a conference. They had the the ancient African Christianity conference, and I, I went there in two thousand five, two thousand six. And he has a, a historical cemetery um, adjacent to his property, his family property, right? And just seeing everything, he had you know he had the Ozark uh, Afro Ozark Museum, seeing all these artifacts, all these things. It was it was incredible, it was eye opening to me. But what was interesting was prior to all this. I had lived in some regard trying to always come out from under from, from my race. If that makes sense, you know, it's like, I, you know, I, I, I tried to hide in being an artist or being a subculture guy and it, it gave me liberation, but, but I also have to recognize there was a hiding underneath it. We can get the whole thing with that, but I bring this up because it was only at that moment that my whole experience of being, you know, black, being African American, in the light of orthodoxy, clicked. It was like, you know, the integration of all these parts of who I was, it which was were great. not integrated. You know what I mean? The they right. all of a sudden, boom! Everything fit in. Everything be it became integrated. And my listening to weird music, my being an artist, like all the things I'd been through, being black, all this stuff just clicked, and it all made sense. And 
And that is that's that's that freedom I was talking about because there's nothing there's 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 nothing in resistance internally anymore. Wow. Because if if there is, Christ has given the the means to deal with it. Repentance, confession, all the sacraments, all that stuff integrates. It helps integrate something that isn't that something that shouldn't be there. Then he then he purifies me of it. And so I I know what it 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 took not just my experiences, John, but my dad's experiences, my mom's experiences, my grandparents' mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. I, it's taken my bloodline and my, and all that. And it's, it's, it's given the integration, Man. you know, orthodoxy's done that. Another beautiful ancient concept, which is th- there you're the culmination of their ex- experiences. That's nutty. And I pay and it deep. back by my prayer, my repentance. Yeah, that's right. right. Guys, I have a shameless thing to send you off with it's shameless and it's self-serving i just want to say thank you before i even say it thank you everyone. uh <laughs> come on cyprian we're going to talk again but i'm just putting it out there because i i have written um done a lot of uh, uh, fiction and i've written a novel it's yada yada the second one i'm writing right now it's just in its infancy i want you to hear this as orthodox brothers it's the story of an ethiopian monk who finds himself a little off the path one day. He's not so sure that he wants to be at the monastery. He finds himself wandering and is captured and then ends up serving out sort of a sentence that he gets in trouble for near the coast of Ethiopia, uh, really Eritrea, and is picked up by a wayward Portuguese slaving ship. It was 16, 16, uh, sorry, 1686. And ends up going around the horn and gets dumped eventually in South Carolina. Now, no one knows he's a monk by this point, so he's carried in his Christianity. And now the Christians of the New World are educating him about Christianity while enslaving him. And that is my novel, and it's coming. Wow. And I like that. Wow. Yeah, because the identity will be offered through the novel, the true identity of his being, and he's going to finally be able to say it as he learns English what his true identity is, even though he's being treated one way. And I, I can't wait to tell the story. It's been brewing up since I, my last book. So if you know anybody else there wants to bankroll that, you let them, you let them know. That's my self-serving. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, <laughs> may it be blessed. <laughs> may it be blessed, Father. May it be blessed. I love you guys. This was a joy, and I'm glad you both were able to come on. It's a real joy. We're not done, though. Okay, Thank Cyprian, you. we got to keep going. We'll talk. Yes, 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 and- please. Yeah, and your podcast, guys, I'll put all the links. Royal Path, it's wonderful. You're you're at peace. It's a joy to listen to. Um, and it's, it's, it's super. Say hi to Andrew. And um, folks, go listen to their podcast. And Orthodox and non-Orthodox, because you guys get into a lot of cool topics. So anything else you want to say other than that? Just thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak with you. I had a blast. It was really yeah. good. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see you again soon. And um, God bless you out there in Saipan with your family. And Father, I'll see you. I'm making the rounds. I'll talk to you about uh, coming in. Maybe we'll give a little talk out of your parish someday about what we. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Okay. All right, guys. Take care. Thanks, Thanks, John. Bye. Peace out. Okay. Royal Path. Check out their podcast. That was fantastic. Thanks for coming on, guys. This is John. This is www.first-things.org. This is our podcast called Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? Please keep tuning in and do me a favor. Become a recurring donor. Take some dough. Put it into our web machine at www.first-things.org. Make it a recurring donation and then get into our podcast for free. Our part course this winter starts November 29th is What is Love? What is the History of Love? In fact, that is the title of the class, The History of Love. We'll check out all the elements of all the cultures through time. How did they understand marriage? How did they understand love? And how should it be legislated? What is it? Why was it the history of love this winter when you become a recurring donor? There's other cool things going on. Be sure to support our work. Find us, support us. You can volunteer for some volunteer positions we have online. Who loves you? See you soon. I'm Watar.